morning. Well, Pastor Will is enjoying a well-deserved vacation this week. And I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but in addition to his many pastoral duties, preaching, teaching, leading Bible studies and discipleship groups, counseling, he also trained for and recently completed an Ironman triathlon. They say that this Ironman triathlon is one of the most difficult one-day sporting events in the world. Here's what you have to do. You have to swim two and a half miles. You then bike 112 miles. And then run, after all that, a full marathon, 26 miles. Now, why anyone would do this, I have no idea whatsoever. But he did it. It was funny. I was talking with my family about it. I was explaining that, you know, he finished this. What a great achievement. Took him around 13 hours uh, to complete it. And my uh, teenage daughter said, 13 hours? I can't even stay awake that long. <laughs> well, we're hope, uh, we hope he's enjoying some rest and relaxation and maybe, you know, put his feet up, enjoy a movie or something. Speaking of movies, you know, last weekend, the latest movie in the Marvel series, Black Widow, released, and it was did the best that any movie has done since the pandemic hit, it brought in $80 million. What was more interesting to me was that they brought in an additional $60 million streaming on Disney+. 75% of what they took in at the box office, they made via their streaming service. And we've seen this. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been streaming a lot during the pandemic, but we've seen this spike in streaming propelled by everybody being home all the time. CNBC recently reported that Americans spent 44% more time streaming video in the fourth quarter of 2020 than they did the year prior. And what this has led to is an intensification of what they're calling the streaming wars. So you think about companies like Netflix, HBO Max, Apple TV, Prime Video, all vying for viewership. And what these companies have identified as one of the key weapons in hooking viewers is sexually explicit content. There was a recent article on BBC. It was titled, Sex Sells, The New Age of Explicit TV. And here is one, what one expert in the industry was cited as saying. In the age of streaming, where there is so much content being released, moments having something particularly shocking or sexual that will fuel itself on social media is a precious weapon in the war for attention. So what has been the result? And in order to hook viewers, what we've seen is that sexual content on these TV shows is becoming more and more graphic. Content that years ago may have been only seen in an X-rated film is now easily accessible available via your favorite streaming service in the comfort of your home on your TV, phone, or tablet. When you consider that and then factor in other cultural trends like the rise of expressive individualism, a belief that meaning is derived from finding your innermost desires and fulfilling them, which has really led to sexuality and the expression of it becoming core to one's identity, Or another cultural trend, the rise of moral relativism, a belief that there there is no absolute right or wrong. What I would like to suggest to you today is that what we are witnessing are all these things coming together and fueling a culture of lust. And what I would like to consider today is what should the Christian's response be in light of these cultural dynamics, in light of what we are seeing being fueled, a culture of lust. And to that, I'd ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Very familiar passage of scripture. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading in verse 27. This is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. 
For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. As we consider this morning what the Christian's response should be in light of this culture of lust, I want us to see three main things. I want us to see that this is a matter of the heart. Secondly, that requires a militant response. And finally, that points us to our need for a merciful Savior. First, it's a matter of the heart. Jesus said, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is correcting the false or incomplete teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, they would have certainly taught people to obey the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. But their focus was strictly on the physical act. And Jesus here is saying something that would have been radical to the listeners. He is saying that you can break that commandment without ever physically touching anybody. He is saying you can break that commandment without even being married. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, boy or girl, single or married. If you look at someone with lustful intent, and I think it's important here to pause, let's define what is being meant here. What does he mean by lustful intent? I would define it this way. An overmastering desire or craving that seeks to satisfy sexual appetites outside of the place that God has designed for them to be fulfilled, which is in the covenant of marriage. I'll say that again. An overmastering desire or craving seeking to satisfy sexual appetites outside of the place God has designed for them to be fulfilled in the covenant of marriage. If you're looking at someone that way, you have committed adultery in your heart. How can that be? What Jesus is doing here is he is showing the true intent or the true spirit of the law. And that is something that the religious leaders of that day had completely disregarded. The true intent or spirit of the law that requires not just purity and holiness with our bodies, with our physical action, actions, but also, as John Calvin said, pure and holy affections of the heart. The larger catechism, I think, summarizes it well. The duties required in the seventh commandment are chastity in body, mind, affections, words, and behavior. I'll give you an example. Some of you who are here who are parents may relate to this scenario. Let's say there's a mom of two boys, and she comes in the room, and she sees one of the boys kick his brother. So the mom says, Tommy, don't kick your brother. The mom leaves the room. A few minutes later, she comes back in, and she sees Tommy punch his brother. And she says, Tommy, hey, I just told you not to do that. And Tommy says, no, no you said not to kick my brother. I didn't kick my brother. I punched him. Mother, I have obeyed your command. The child is neglecting the heart of the command. The heart of the command is don't cause physical harm to your brother. And I think we can fall into the trap of thinking this way too. We can fall into the trap of thinking, okay, I've obeyed God's command. I've never had sex with someone other than my husband. Or I've never had sex with someone other than my wife. But then lustfully look at someone in our heart or lustfully look at sexually immoral scenes on our television screen or have our minds filled with lustful fantasies. On the outside, it's like we followed all the rules. We've checked all the boxes to think we're good, but actually have a heart that is far from God. That was what was true of the Pharisees. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also appear outwardly righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. God looks on the heart. It is out of the heart that these things, like evil thoughts, sexual immorality, adultery, come. Yes, committing the physical act of adultery is sin. Yes, having sex outside of marriage is sin. But there is a much deeper problem at the root that needs to be addressed. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way, sin is not merely an action or matter of actions or deeds. It is something within the heart that leads to the action. Sins are nothing but the symptoms of a disease called sin. The trouble is in your heart. 
All else is but the expression. So the first thing we need to see here is that this is a matter of the heart. Obedience to the God's commandments are not just a matter of mere external conformity, but also it requires pure and holy affections within. So a matter of the heart. But secondly, I want to see what it requires. It requires a militant response. Jesus says in verses 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is a very challenging saying here. What does Jesus mean when he says to tear out your right eye if it's causing you to sin or to cut off your hand? Are are we to understand this literally? Well, in 2008, a man in Idaho who believed he had the mark of the beast on his hand read this passage, went out to his garage with a circular chainsaw and cut off his hand. He also then proceeded to microwave the dismembered hand. I'm not sure where he got that from the text, that last piece, but apparently something I think was likely going on in in his mental struggles, but took this literally, went and cut off his hand. And believe it or not, there were many, I should say there were some in the early church who also understood this literally and physically cut off their hands in response to Jesus' teaching here. Well, is that what we're called to do? Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, I think if it was, it would directly contradict what Paul said to the Colossians. Paul said to them, he said, there are some things that have an appearance of wisdom in promoting asceticism and severity to the body. But notice what Paul said here. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The reality is, you could remove your eye, you could cut off your hand, and never quench the lust that is in your heart. So no, I don't think we should be taking what Jesus is saying here literally. I think Jesus is using hyperbole. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's an exaggerated statement that's not to be taken literally. So no, Jesus isn't saying literally, pluck out your eye or cut off your hand. He's not promoting self-mutilation, but... We need to be very careful not to minimize what he's saying here. Jesus is calling for extreme measures. He is calling for immediate, aggressive action in the fight against lust. Look at the language. Tear it out and throw it away. Cut it off and throw it away. Immediate, aggressive action. Sinclair Ferguson put it this way. Jesus is saying, act decisively, immediately, even if it must be painful. Why the urgency? Well, I think we see the warning clear in the text. Continuing to persist in unrepentant lust or unrepentant sexual immorality leads to hell. We read this earlier in Ephesians 5. Paul said, you may be sure of this. Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Sometimes my family, and we play a game called Would you rather, this is a family-friendly kid version of a game called Would You Rather. Interested in seeing how many of you have played this game, but here's an example. You kind of have these different scenarios, you throw them out there and you see what people would rather have. So we're going to do it right now, okay? You're going to audience participation, isn't that fun? Would you rather live without air conditioning or heat? How many would say air conditioning? Uh, How many would say heat? Uh, I think air conditioning wins, okay. Here's another one. Would would you rather shave all your hair or lose all your teeth? We won't vote on that one. That's all right. (laughs) I think what what we have here in front of us is a would you rather situation. Jesus is saying, would you rather lose your eye, your hand, whatever that thing is that is causing you to sin while here on this life for the 60, 70, 80 years you may have, or have your whole body thrown into hell forever? The answer is obvious. And Jesus doesn't leave it open to imagination. He says very clearly, it is better that you lose one of those things than that you have your whole body thrown into hell forever. He says, get rid of it. To keep it, to hold on to it, to cling it to it, will result in leading to hell. And when we see what's at stake here, I think we see a folly, a foolishness in what many people's responses are to this area of lust. I'm going to throw out three examples. 
Tell me if you've uh, heard this before. It's harmless. I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking at it. I'm not hurting anybody. Another one. I'm mature enough to handle it. Or a third one, one of my favorites. I need to be educated so that I can discuss with my coworkers and my neighbors. That is not what the Bible says about how we are to handle or deal with the lust of the flesh. The Bible says that fleshly lust wage war against your soul. You're not harmless. It says that we're not to play around with them. It says make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The language of the Bible says flee sexual immorality. It says put to death what is earthly in you. David in the psalm said, I will set no worthless things before my eyes. And then he said, I love this, I will know nothing of evil. That was his heart's desire. That was his prayer. So we see this immediate aggressive action that Christ is calling us to in this fight against lust. Well, what might that look like? Well, Grammy award-winning hip-hop artist Lecrae has a great Christian testimony, great autobiography if you're interested in reading it, powerful testimony. One of the things that he says that he does to cut it off, to remove the temptation from him, is that when he's on the road and he has beautiful women hand him his phone number, he immediately takes it and hands it to his crew. You know what he tells his crew to do with it? Shred it. That's in a way that this artist Lecrae said, this is the way I'm cutting it off. This is the way I'm taking action. Now, maybe you're like me, and that's not a common problem you have in your life. So what might the extreme measure look for you or I? What extreme measure might Christ be calling us to? Well, maybe it's cancel the streaming service. I can't do that. I might miss out on so much. Again, what is better for you? Is it better to lose it or to lose your soul? What is the extreme measure Christ is calling you to this morning? Maybe it's you're keeping your phone and your computer out of your bedroom. Not even bringing it in there if that's where your temptation lies. Maybe it's trashing that book that you're reading that's causing all these lustful fantasies to fill your mind and to be dwelled on. Maybe it's even breaking off that sexually immoral relationship that you're currently in. I think the mentality we should have and what we see here in Jesus' words is whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I'm going to remove this temptation that is keeping me from Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, no sacrifice is too great if it enables us to conquer a lust that cuts us off from Jesus. So this requires a militant response. Don't put it off. Act now, tear it out, cut it off. And we know this is only something we can do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, if we're going to be willing and able to make these kinds of sacrifices, Jesus must have our heart's supreme affection. Our love for him must far exceed any other earthly desire. And that is what leads to my final point. We've seen this as a matter of the heart. It requires a militant response. But it points us to our need for a merciful Savior. When we see God's standard of holiness, we see how far short we fall. We see that disease of sin within us. Our shame, our guilt our impurity. And like it says in Proverbs, who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from my sin. Even the things we might think are righteous deeds are filthy in his sight. So what hope can there be for vile sinners like us? I have good news for you this morning. There's a fountain. It's a fountain that's filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners who are plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And that fountain, where all your sins can be washed away, is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is found in the sinless, spotless, pure Lamb of God who loved you so much that he took all of our impurity, all of our sin and uncleanness on himself, on the cross, and shed his precious blood so that we could be washed clean so we could be made new. The NBA Finals are going on right now. Not sure how many basketball fans we have in here. But two teams, Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks. And the coach of the Phoenix Suns is a man named Monty Williams. 
And again, another individual with an amazing Christian testimony. Five years ago, Monty's wife, Ingrid, was driving home after one of her kids' basketball games when a woman who was hopped up on meth and driving 92 miles per hour in a 40 mile per hour zone swerved around a car into Ingrid's lane and smashed into her head on. The woman died at the scene and Ingrid uh, slipped away the following day. Monty Williams gave a speech at the funeral. You can find this on YouTube. Monty Williams' speech, boom, comes right up. And he said something that was shocking at the funeral. He said something that blew away people there who weren't Christians, people in the professional basketball, like, just they couldn't understand why he would say this. Here's what he said. He said, let's not forget that there were two people in this situation. And that family needs prayer as well. We have no ill will towards that family. In my house, there is a sign that says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We can't serve the Lord if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. What would lead someone to show radical mercy like that? To show that level of forgiveness? Where in that same speech, Monty Williams said, God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for my sins. And I, for one, know I am not the man you see every day. That external view. And he said, only God could cover that, the sin that is within him. Monty Williams knew his sin. He knew his impurity. He knew that he had nothing in himself that could clean himself up. He needed Jesus' blood to wash him clean. And that's the same thing that you and I need. Now you might say to me, Brian, you don't know the sexual sins of my past. Fly to the fountain. Turn to Jesus in faith and repentance and regardless of your past, regardless of what you have done, you can be washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can lose all your guilty stains. You may say to me, Brian, you don't know the sexual sins of my present. I know I'm saved, but I'm struggling. I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with temptation. Fly to the fountain. David was a man who struggled with lust and temptation. He lusted after Bathsheba, then committed adultery with her, and then murdered her husband. And where did David turn? Where did he fly to? He flew to the fountain. In Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And David was made whiter than snow, just like you and I can be. In this fight against lust, our ultimate need is for a merciful Savior to wash us and to make us new. The term purity culture has come back in the headlines recently. I'm not sure how many of you uh, heard about this. There was a contemporary Christian music artist who, as a joke for his teenage daughters, wrote a song called Modest is Hottest and got an immediate backlash uh, on social media and on the Internet and eventually took that down. Now, no matter what you think about that song, no matter what you may think about that movement in the late 90s, early 2000s, instead of going along with this culture of lust, as children of God, as those who have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, we should be seeking to promote and foster a culture of true biblical purity. James Boyce, the, the late pastor of 10th Press in Philadelphia, said, we must fight a debased and a perverted morality with a pure one. Would you commit to that today? Would you commit in your own life, in the lives of your families, to promote and foster a culture of true biblical purity? Would you commit to that for God's glory, for the good of your soul? This is the will of God, your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you Know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like those who don't know God. For God has not called us to impurity. He has called us to holiness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word is truth. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us by it. 
Lord, when we read these things, when we hear what Jesus calls us to, we know that in and of ourselves, we can't do it. We don't have the power. And so I thank you for our merciful Savior who is abounding in steadfast love, who sends his spirit. And Lord, would you enable us more and more to die to the things of this world, to grow in our love for you. And Lord, I pray that we would live for you and be willing to make those tough sacrifices, anything, Lord, that would keep us from you, that we would be willing to throw it away out of love for our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.